I miss WCW. Maybe not what happened in the year 2000 or 1999, and yeah, that thing at the end of 1998 wasn't great, but for a while it was awesome, and despite being a WWE guy at heart, I enjoyed seeing the competition go crazy. It was electric, and you never knew what either company was going to pull out. In many ways, this surge started with Hulk Hogan when he jumped ship in 1994. That was the catalyst which also got the likes of the Macho Man, Randy Savage, and the Big Boss Man to come across, and the revolution began. These type of faces we know, but even today, there's still a bunch of wrestlers that you can stare at who truly did ply their trade in World Championship Wrestling without even triggering a memory. Make of that what you will. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 WCW stars from the 90s you totally don't remember. Number 10, Disorderly Conduct. A name you hear and instantly think old school wrestling, Disorderly Conduct was made up of tough Tom and mean Mike, and that's all you need to know. We're sticking with the obvious here, and screw you if you don't like it. A team designed to be jobbers for more popular duos, their claim to fame came in 1998 where they lost to the Steiners on Nitro. They also received a WWE tryout in 2000 where they performed on Jacked, and even there, they lost. Throughout their entire career, they never really got that big of a break. However, if from 1997 to 2000 you attended a WCW house show, you could have put money on the fact disorderly conduct would have turned up in some guys. That may have been a trifle annoying as you came to the event hoping to see Harlem Heat, but that's just the magic of wrestling when the cameras are off. Nothing counts, and you get to see teams like Disorderly Conduct. Number 9, Emery Hale. On paper, Emery Hale was going to be one of WCW's top stars. Not only did he stand at 6 foot 9 and weigh around 350 pounds, but his manager was one Jimmy Hart. That seems like a combination ready to receive a super push to the moon. That isn't what happened. After making his debut in 1998, Hale was only ever able to compete on non televised events as he twirled away waiting for his chance. He did make a few appearances on Nitro and Thunder, including including one as the machine, which you should go and Google now and see if your brain can process it, but then vanished from the company and didn't do much else in wrestling. He had a small role in the XWF, but that didn't last longer than a hiccup. Tragically too, Emery fell sick with kidney issues in 2006 and passed away because of it. He was only 36 years old, and that is straight up horrible. How different it could have been. Number 8, Ice Train. As well as his name, which I oddly like because it's the most pro wrestling thing ever, Ice Train was also paired with Terry Long without ever appearing in an impromptu tag match. That's quite the feat player. He was featured in a team, however, as he formed Fire and Ice with Scott Norton, who did manage to break through just a little bit. At the Great American Bash in 1996, they had a title match against the Steiners, although ultimately they lost. Shortly after this, they broke up, and the failure must have been a bit too much. That wasn't it for Ice Train, however, because he did make a few other pay-per-view appearances, and for a while, did have a little bit of momentum going for himself. It's just that when all that was over, it fell apart pretty quickly. He slowly disappeared from our screens, and we never really heard from him again. I hope he's doing okay. Number 7, Firebreaker Chip. I don't get the name. I really don't. As you can figure out, Firebreaker Chip was a fireman who just so happened to wrestle, but why is his name framed this way? Why can't he just be Chip and then you learn he also fights fires? It's Duke the Dumpster Drozzy all over again. Unsurprisingly, the Firebreaker never really did anything in WCW during 1991 or 1992 other than job to other people. That's irresponsible because while he was losing in the ring, there was probably a bunch of blazing infernos he was meant to be putting out. In many ways, this is the ultimate heel gimmick. He did have one moment in the sun where he and tag partner Todd Champion won the WCW United States Tag Team belts from the Freebirds, but the company in the early 90s was utterly lost and would throw anything at the wall to try and get something to stick. Chip wasn't it. A quick shout out for Todd as years later he secured a match against Steven Regal for the TV title and he didn't do so bad. Could hold his head up high afterwards, even though he lost. As for Chip, well, all things considered, he kind of looked a bit like a stripper. Number 6, Hard Work Bobby Walker. Not sure about the nickname Hard Work. It just sounds like if we hang out, you're going to be really difficult and annoy me. Bobby Walker did have quite the run, though, because from 1992 to 2000, he was part of the WCW roster. Somehow, during that time, he only wrestled on one pay-per-view match, and that was in the Battle Royal at the World War III pay-per-view in 1996. A product of WCW's power plant, he mainly appeared on Saturday Night Pro and Worldwide, all shows that were considered B-events at best. The poor guy couldn't catch a break either, as he was meant to be Ron Simmons' partner at Clash of the Champions 21, but was replaced by Two Gold Scorpio when he got injured. That sucks! Oddly, his last couple of opponents ranged from Barry Horowitz to the two-time IWGP heavyweight champion, 
Yugi Nagata. Try and do six degrees of separations for that. Number five, Akira Hokuto. In case you don't know, Akira Hokuto won countless championships in a career that spanned almost 17 years. Throughout the 80s, she was a must-see in all Japan women and repeated that feat when she spent two years in Mexico CMLL. That ran from about 1993 to 1995, and by 1996, she was working exclusively in Gaya, Japan. In between all that, though, she found time to wrestle with Bull Nakano against Mayumi Ozaki and Cutie Suzuki at World War III in 1995, and even that wasn't the end of her WCW adventure. Hakoto feuded with Medusa over the short-lived women's title and incredibly won it at Starcade 1995 to boot. With all that under her belt, why would you forget about her then? Well, WCW barely recognized the women's division and didn't talk about Hakoto's legacy at all after she was gone. She was pretty much written out of the history books completely, which is ridiculous. Why did you even bother to begin with? That is what happened and why lists like this are important. Keep the memory alive. Number four, Yoshi Kwan. One of the weirdest thing about Yoshi Kwan, he had fake eyebrows. That's something new, isn't it? What do you do when everything else is done? You slap some hair above your eyes. WrestleMania, here we come. The real-life Chris Champion came to WCW in 1993 under the watch of Harley Race, and because it was the early 90s, he was portrayed as the sneaky, stereotypical foreign heel, hence the name change. He did get to tangle with Cactus Jack, which is pretty good, but that was mostly because Race's other guy, Big Van Vader, was also fighting Mick Foley. Fortunately, none of this lasted that long. After a match with Cactus at Full Brawl, he took some time off to fix his knee and never returned. That was it. He came in, showed off those brows, and then vanished entirely. Don't forget too that if anybody did this now, the company responsible would rightfully be destroyed, an American given a cheap makeup job and told to be an Asian bad guy. That is horrendous. Number three, the Minotaur. You know it's bad straight away because of the name. You don't want to be named after a Greek mythological beast. That gimmick isn't going to last more than five minutes. But that's what Steve DeSalvo got when he arrived in WCW, even though he looked a bit like the ultimate warrior from a physique standpoint. Didn't help at all. In 1990, he arrived in World Championship Wrestling, though, got given this name, and then was never allowed to do anything to explain why it was the case. He was just called that because, I guess, somebody thought it was cool. It was not cool, and he mostly appeared on on World Championship Wrestling Saturday Night and House Shows, and by 1991 his star had already faded. The weirdest thing is he did have a few tryouts for the WWF from 1987 to 1990, and yet they never signed him, even though he had the size that was all the rage back then. He wasn't able to get in and instead had to be a half bull man. Brilliant. Number two, Roadblock. Up there with Repo Man in terms of gimmicks, Roadblock was a dude who pretended he was traffic stoppage. I mean, what? Where did that come from? Signing on with WCW in 1996 and joining this crew of wrestlers who would make up the numbers for the Saturday night tapings, Roadblock was able to wiggle his way onto Nitro and challenge Lex Luger when he was there. Amazingly, he lost. All this got so much more dumb when he entered the 1996 version of World War III and decided to write Dead End on his ring gear. Now, I know what he was getting at, but that was almost like summing up his career on his singlet. It didn't help because despite being in the promotion for three years, he was constantly under the radar. Good old Roadblock did alright right mind, he was still wrestling up till 2012 on the indie scene until he called it a day. That ain't too shabby. Who knew the road could be so long? Number one, Norman the Lunatic. While this should be eyebrow raising, Mike Shaw actually made a career out of awful gimmicks. He was Bastion Booger and Mad Monk Fryer Ferguson in the WWF, and over in WCW he found himself as Trucker Norm, which soon evolved into, yes, Norman the Lunatic. I'm not 100% sure, but I think he professed to be crazy simply because he carried a small teddy bear around with him. And furthermore, he was meant to be a face. Someone in WCW must have realized this as the lunatic part of his name vanished eventually, and then he was just Norman, a role he played until he was released in 1991. He was managed by Teddy Long, who was a right asshole as well. He would carry around a massive key that was there to remind Norman that if he did anything out of line, Long could lock him back up in the asylum. One, just no, and two, what kind of building is this? Honestly, the key was absolutely massive. Of course, don't even worry about it if you can't remember Norman the Lunatic. He probably doesn't even remember it himself because he was a lunatic. Know of any other WCW stars from the 90s people totally don't remember? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles, follow what culture on Twitter, what culture WWE, and go and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon Miller. Thank you very much for watching and make sure you now turn back the hands of time and go and check out other wrestlers that may have been forgotten from WCW in the 90s. It's not nice to be forgotten. It makes 
makes you feel sad and pine for better days. You know what else? I'll speak to you again soon.